Our second reading also comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 37 through 45. Please listen for God's word to you today. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will, not, will scarcely leave him alone. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. While everyone was amazed at what all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands. But they did not understand this saying. Its meaning was concealed from them, so they could not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about what he was saying. As most of you already know, when my husband and I were first married, we lived in California. Consequently, both of our daughters were born in the San Francisco Bay Area. When our girls were young, the girls and I would visit the coastal city of Monterey once a month. It was always a grand adventure. There was the Fisherman's Wharf and Cannery Row made famous by Steinbeck tidal pools crawling with sea creatures along the Pacific coast, and a world-class aquarium, which we would visit every time we went to Monterey, along with nearly two million visitors a year. Unknown to those other two million visitors, there was another far less frequented aquarium in the San Francisco Bay Area. It is called the Long's Marine Lab, and it is owned by the University of California, Santa Cruz. It is an impressive little aquarium, not at all commercial, where they do research, and where, although they are rarely open to the public, they do occasionally allow school groups to tour their facilities. While we lived in California, my daughter Jennifer's first grade class was fortunate enough to do a tour of Long's Marine Lab. The entire tour was fascinating. But the highlight of the tour, by far, for the children, and I also must confess by the adults as well, was a large, round, above-ground cement pool with a pair of sea lions. The sea lions had been rescued as pups and the marine biologists at the University of Santa Cruz took care of them and studied them. While the marine biologists introduced the sea lions to the children and talked about their studies with the sea lions, the sea lions themselves swam as fast as they could around the pool over and over and over again, causing a great vortex to form so that waves began to form, and the water sloshed over the cement sides, splashing the first graders, and their adult chaperones. The sea lions would then ride the waves. And occasionally, one of the sea lions would use the momentum of the water to jump up really high into the air and would look out toward the ocean, seemingly longingly in the distance. Noting this, one of the adult chaperones inquired about whether or not the sea lions would be released back into the wild. The marine biologist grinned and responded that it was unlikely, for whenever they took the sea lions out into the ocean to do studies, the sea lions would be buffeted about by the currents and the waves of the open sea, and they would become agitated and distressed so much so that the sea lions would stay right next to the boats 
and even on occasion, they would climb back into the boat with the marine biologists. It would seem that although the sea lions loved to frolic and play in the waves of their own making, they preferred the small protected pool to the open ocean where they belonged. Aren't we kind of like that? In today's scripture reading from the Gospel of Luke, a mountaintop experience is described. Now, biblically speaking, mountaintop experiences suggest that something significant is going to happen. For example, Moses first encountered God and later received the Ten Commandments on a mountaintop. Elijah was challenged by the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah to a showdown, proving Yahweh to be the true God on a mountaintop. Indeed, Jesus himself was offered all the kingdoms of the world by Satan, if he would just bow down and worship Satan on a mountaintop. But Jesus chose to worship and serve God alone. Indeed, biblically speaking, when there is a mountaintop experience, we can reliably anticipate that something deeply revelatory is about to be disclosed. In today's story, we are not disappointed. Indeed, one might say that when it comes to mountaintop experiences, Peter and James and John hit the jackpot. For we are told that eight days after Peter declared Jesus to be the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus took Peter and James and John up onto a mountain to pray. And while Jesus was praying, Jesus was transfigured so that the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzlingly white. And Moses and Elijah appeared with him in glory while they talked of his departure, which was to be accomplished in Jerusalem. Peter and James and John, seeing God's glory in Jesus and in Moses and in Elijah who stood with him. Peter, who tends to talk when he gets nervous or excited. Peter babbles, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Apparently, Peter's response was, well, rather off course. For while Peter spoke, a cloud came and overshadowed them so that they were terrified. And a voice from the cloud, the voice of God himself, speaks to them saying, this is my son, the chosen. Listen to him. I suspect that deep down, deep down, we all have a longing to experience, however briefly, the transcendent power of God, and the absolute divinity of Christ, in such a way that we no longer have any question about who God is. For we think, we think if only, if only I could have a mountaintop experience, if only God spoke directly to me, if only God's wishes were made crystal clear to me, if only, then, then, I would be absolutely sure in my faith. Then I would know what God wanted me to do certain, and then 
I would confidently do it. And yet, and yet, here are Peter and James and John who followed in the very footsteps of Jesus himself experiencing the jackpot of mountaintop experiences, witnessing this extraordinary show of power in the transfiguration of Jesus, witnessing what appears to be an unquestionable revelation of the divinity of Christ. And yet, and yet, Peter and James and John, they still don't get it. For the Gospel of Luke tells us that after they have experienced this unquestionable revelation, they come down from the mountain and Jesus leads them back into the world where they encounter a crowd. And Jesus is approached by a man who kneels down before him and begs him to heal his son who is possessed by an unclean spirit which makes him shriek and convulses him until he foams at the mouth. The man brings his son to Jesus for healing because the man had begged the disciples to cast out the demon, but they could not. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly like to think that if I had had the mountaintop experience which Peter and James and John had just experienced, it would shake me up. It would change my world. It would empower me. It would make me different. But would it really? Would we really be any different than Peter and James and John? Peter's first instinct was to stay on the mountaintop. Indeed, he wanted to build dwellings where they could stay in worship, where it was safe, and where they could remain sure of who Jesus really was. Kind of like the sea lions. The sea lions, who although they look longingly toward the ocean daily, ultimately choose to stay within the safety of their small protected pool instead of braving the open ocean. Kind of like us and our churches, perhaps, where we like to worship together and support one another in faith, but we prefer not to venture out into the community around us where we do not feel safe sharing our faith. And yet, and yet we are not really like the sea lions when it comes to our faith. For we don't go it alone. If the sea lions were to return to the ocean where they belong, ultimately they would go it alone. For the marine biologists who have cared for them since they were pups cannot stay with them in the open ocean, for the ocean is not the world of the marine biologists themselves. We However, do not go out into the world alone. For Jesus, Jesus who calls us to follow, sends us out into the world, not alone, but with the Holy Spirit. Immediately following the mountaintop experience, Peter and James and John did not really get it for it had not yet transformed their faith so that they could heal the man's son. But eventually, eventually they did get it. 
Indeed, in the book of Acts, in chapter 3, we are told that one day Peter and John were going up into the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried in. People would lay him down daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at the man, as did John. And he said to the man, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And Peter took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And jumping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Eventually, eventually, Peter and James and John, they got it. And they were empowered to go out into the world doing God's work in the name of Jesus Christ. So, how can we be more like the Peter and the John in Acts who healed the man lame from birth rather than like the Peter, the James, and the John who couldn't heal the boy immediately after their unquestionable revelation of God's glory in Christ. Not a trick question. The Gospel of Matthew offers a helpful insight. The Gospel of Matthew shares with us that when Jesus cast out the unclean spirit from the boy, doing what the disciples were unable to do. The disciples asked Jesus later in private, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, this kind can come out only through prayer. Only through prayer. Only through prayer. When we feel inhibited, about answering Christ's call to do God's work, when we feel like we want to stay where it's safe, when we feel like we do not want to venture out much like the sea lions, we need to pray. So let us pray. Good people of Milford Presbyterian Church, let us pray. Let us pray and do God's work in the name of Jesus Christ.